Welcome to Math Life Balance. On this channel, I'm doing interviews with professional mathematicians and they have been giving lots of great advice for doing research. And I'm also tempted to give advice, but since you are already getting lots of good advice, I'd like to give a different kind of advice. Bad, nasty and mean advice. So in this video, I want to give some life hacks to you as a PhD student or a postdoc on how to convince yourself that you are the worst researcher in the world. By the way, I was told by my senior colleagues that it's a bad idea to do a video about my own psychological struggle with math. So here is a disclaimer. This video has absolutely nothing to do with my personal experience. Let me start with an inclusivity statement. I believe that everyone can apply successful advice from this video. For example, you don't have to be a mathematician. I'll only be speaking about mathematics because this is my job. Or you don't have to belong to a minority. You don't even have to lack academic achievements or have a low overall self-esteem. We've been advocating for inclusivity in academia. And finally, here it is. The fundamental thing is the relationship that you build with your research. For a successful abusive relationship, I recommend one that is inspired by an expression in Russian, the temple of science. So imagine an ancient temple. In this temple, mathematics is the goddess and you are her priest, making sacrifices to satisfy her wills. This way, you can never possibly do enough mathematics. The divine beauty of math will become a reminder of how little you are doing for your goddess. And guilt is very engaging, so you'll never get bored. As a dedicated priest, you can't seriously consider making a plan B in case your academic career doesn't work out. But on the other hand, every time you feel helpless with math, you should doubt whether this profession was the right choice for you. And when your peers leave academia, you feel disappointed and perhaps even offended because they quit their sacred duty. To this you might say, but I love math and can't live without it. Sure, I don't doubt your affection for research, but love is dangerous and it can provide a foundation for building an abusive relationship. Clearly, in this story you are the victim. However, math itself has never done anything bad to you. So then, you're also the abuser? Mysterious, huh? Let me emphasize, it's all about your attitude. Math will always be bigger than you, and knowing this, you can choose how to deal with it. For example, it's up to you what to call doing research. There is no fixed definition, so you could choose within the whole process of engaging with mathematics the part that is the hardest for you, the one you avoid the most, and call that research, while calling all the other parts tasks and stuff. In this way, you will surely feel that you aren't working on the things that matter. And here is the paradox. While you keep learning new math and making actual progress in research, you also get closer to the goal of being the worst researcher in the world. For example, say you're trying to understand some proof and you're stuck. So you're feeling unproductive. And then you finally understand it. Tell yourself immediately, well, what took you so long? Since now that you understand the proof, it looks rather simple. Another fun fact. The more math you learn, the more math around you you feel you should know. For example, say you're at a conference. While you're increasing your math vocabulary, make sure to get overwhelmed with how much math you don't know since you haven't even heard of it before that conference. Also, ask yourself regularly, am I good enough to do math? This rhetorical question has an amazing feature. It can upset you every time as strongly as the first, even if you ask it a thousand times. And whenever you're upset with math, you can always double your pain by reminding yourself that your frustration helps absolutely no one. To keep going, it's important to have a good balance of joy and pain, so make sure to get joy from math. Just remember that the joy is thanks to math, and the pain is your own fault. 
This creates a delightful emotional roller coaster. Altogether, it's a game you can't lose, a game where everyone can be a winner. I believe that the most effective way to be unproductive is by ignoring your body signals. For example, say you were trying to understand some proof and you felt hungry, but decided to finish reading first and then go for lunch. I'm no expert in biology, but as far as I understand, you feeling hungry means that your brain is telling you that it currently lacks glucose. And you trying to finish the proof means asking your brain to give away more glucose. So it's very likely that your brain will not agree to spend any more glucose on the proof, no matter how important it is for you to feel like you've finished something. And this way you'll find yourself half an hour later being tired and feeling unproductive. Congratulations! Uh, by the way, in the last half an hour you have actually been unproductive, so now you can easily convince yourself that you are an unproductive person in general. More generally, build your expectations of the work you will do based only on the time that you have at your disposal. It should not matter to you how you feel, how motivated you are, or even uh, how many hugs you had recently. All that matters is the amount of time, the degrees swept by earth rotation. With this perspective, every morning you'll believe that you'll do a lot since you have the entire day ahead of you, and by the end of the day you'll often find yourself disappointed. Finally, you can always come up with a reason to blame yourself. Either you worked too little today or you were unproductive. It's a fine balance, because there is no way you can work a lot and be productive at the same time, right? Well, in case you can, I'm really sorry for you. But please know, you are also valid. The key tip for comparing yourself with colleagues is in focusing your attention on the most brilliant mathematician. That's really easy, since their personas are so shiny and they are discussed the most often. So watch them and observe how different you are. To do so, you can create an image of a true mathematician and then try to notice in every colleague only those pieces of their personality that fit your imaginary portrait. Needless to say, that portrait should be very different from yourself. Also, collecting ways in which you are a misfit in the math community is quite entertaining. And another important advice, uh, take part in big collaborations with amazing mathematicians. That helps to feel that you aren't contributing anything. And whenever you do have a comment to add to a math discussion, start with, this is not my idea, someone else told it to me. Finally, you can convince yourself that if you have a success, the credit is not yours. Assure yourself that you are in a privileged position, that your achievements are due to a nourishing environment or pure luck. This is easy to do nowadays, thanks both to the politics of positive discrimination or affirmative action and to the popular message, shut up and check your privilege. So it seems like neither a lack of privilege nor its abundance vaccinates you against the feeling that you don't deserve what you have. Use every chance to tell people around how terrible you are at math. Make sure to even find an opportunity for a special conversation with your boss where you explain how you don't deserve your job. And whenever someone tries to comfort you, saying that you aren't doing such a bad job, argue against it. Be passionate, determined and creative at it. Remember that your main argument is unbeatable. But I really, really don't understand math. And forgive people who try to reassure you. They just don't know you well enough. Let me finish the endless advice with the only piece of bad news. While doing research might help to achieve your goal of becoming the worst researcher in the world, therapy can actually be dangerous. You might even eventually start feeling better about yourself and your work. I chose the sarcastic tone for this video because some of this advice may be hard to avoid following, so I didn't want to say, just don't do this to yourself. However, I hope that I gave you some external perspective that could be helpful. And if you liked it, please share the link to the video. And for those who saw something relatable in this video, here is a wish from my co-author 
from the happiness book that my friends made me for graduation.